Have you ever seen Swan Lake before? This is sort of like the ballet version of a famous Beyonce song. You know, everybody knows the, the famous Beyonce songs. They can all sing along well. This is a very famous ballet. Well, for me, there's something missing. The, be the music is gorgeous. The choreography is beautiful. Like you said, it's soft and it's dainty and it's pretty. But there's something missing. in love with it. Your body falls in love with it. Ballet is such a challenge and I love the challenge. When I'm on stage, it's like no one can stop me. It's like singing with your body. I knew that if I kept dancing, I could be like the ballerina on the stage. Mainly, it's a white world. All the ballet company, the core has to be lily white, and the soloist has to have what they prescribe as being the ballet body. So it hasn't changed. I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, and um, the first ballet I ever went to see, I was three years old, and it was Dance Theater of Harlem. I sat on my mom's lap, and I like put my hands on the back of the chair in front of me, and I was just looking up, and like I didn't blink the entire time for like however long, you know, an hour and a half. I was just so like into the show. I knew that if I kept dancing, I could be like the ballerina on the stage. The Dance Theater of Harlem Company came back to Shreveport in 2002. Uh, it was my senior year of high school. I actually took company class with them, and I was so nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, all these beautiful black ballerinas. Afterwards, they asked me if I would like to come to their summer intensive for six weeks in New York City. And I said, yeah, well, of course. And one, two, come on, get that going, and one. And then a year later, Mr. Mitchell asked me to be in the company. Even after I was accepted into the ensemble, um, I told my parents, and they were like, you are not moving to New York City, you know? You're going to college. So I ended up actually going there for two weeks because they didn't want me to go to New York. As young African-American dancers, sometimes they're discouraged from even trying ballet because it's not the norm. People would rather push you towards something that's gonna make money or that's gonna, you know, give you fame. They will always tell someone to go out for the NFL because it's gonna make you millions of dollars. They're not gonna tell you, oh, go, you know, train to be a ballerina and struggle all your life. The parents don't go to ballet. 
they don't see it as an opportunity for their youngsters. And I think if they saw more of themselves on stage, more of them in ballet companies, more of them on television doing just that, they would be encouraged. But I think they get deterred because of the lack of opportunity. And so I cried every single day and I called home and I was like, I don't want to be here, I want to go to New York. And so they finally came and got me and let me come up here and they were like, you get one chance. <laughs> and that's all I needed. I mean, I used to love when people told me I couldn't do something. I'd be like, let me show you because I'm going to do it. My mother works for the school district in Fulton County in Georgia. So every now and then she would get like free comp tickets to come see like a dress rehearsal of Atlanta Ballet. I saw Atlanta Festival Ballet perform The Nutcracker. And there's this dancer named Keila Harvey. She was like the first black ballerina that I ever saw. And she did Dewdrop. And I was just like, oh, I want to do ballet. When I was a student at Atlanta Festival Ballet my senior year in high school, I got to be Clara for the Nutcracker. And there was this unfortunate incident where me and another girl were supposed to be Claire who was Caucasian and there was this big thing about her not wanting to share a costume with me oh that was like the moment where I was like really I haven't even left home yet and this is what I'm getting that was the first big eye-opener that I had as a dancer It really wasn't her reaction that made it disheartening. It was that the, the company didn't stand up for me. I was an avid movie fan. I was a huge fan of Sid Charisse. And I looked at what she was doing in, in my little nine-year-old, ten-year-old self, I thought, oh, I can do that. So I took a friend, uh, and we went to register at all of the downtown schools. I didn't know at the time that the schools were not open to me. God bless my mother. She didn't tell me the reality, because it would have been very upsetting to a little ten-year-old to realize that you're in a city like Philadelphia and you have limited opportunity. At that time, Philadelphia had, in the junior high and high schools, had what they called clubs. I was in the ballet club. When I graduated from high school, I was determined that I was going to go to New York and dance. leap forward a number of years, and I go to School of American Ballet. You had to audition. Thank goodness I was one of the ones to get in. A company was formed in New York, at originally called Ballet Americana. We rehearsed for about a year before we went to, to Britain. And, oh, it was wonderful. We had amazing choreography. We had wonderful costumes and sets. We went over on the, uh, the France, the Ile de France. And, oh, that was so glamorous because at that time you dress for dinner. Uh, we were sort of little celebrities because we were a ballet company. 
they changed our name from Ballet Americana to New York Negro Ballet because they wanted the audiences to think we were exotic. And if we weren't just another American company, uh, they wanted to be clear. We did a lot of modern things, but Bluebird Pas de Deux was something that was familiar. And when we hit that stage, nobody ran screaming out of the theater and <laughs> said, oh God, they shouldn't be doing this. Or, you know, it was, um, it was wonderful warm applause and acceptance. When I came back to New York, I took classes with, with what were principal dancers from New York City Ballet. I was in the front line in the middle in every class. Nobody was being kind to me, because ballet classes, people are not being kind to you. No teacher I've ever studied with put people without ability on the front line. I was certainly up to the work. Uh, there's, you know, when you're raised to believe the harder you work, uh, you know, you're skilled at what you do, you're educated at it, uh, you should have, have a shot. It was nothing. Uh, went to auditions. Um, it didn't matter. I would understand if you don't have the quality. Uh, you don't have to like every dancer uh, if you don't have the ability. But when you're not given the opportunity, simply skin deep, that's a terrible problem. I was born in New York City, in Manhattan, and I grew up in Harlem. We lived up in the Dunbar Apartments. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. She took me to concerts and ballet and museums. She took me to see the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. The light just comes into a glow on the gold curtain, and the conductor picks up his baton, and the rousing mazurka of Coppelia starts. And I started crying because it was so exciting. It was so wonderful, and that it was overwhelming. And then on my ninth birthday, it was a, a present, my first ballet lesson. And everyone wanted to dance in Ballet Russe to Monte Carlo. They had, every year, a huge audition. Everybody came. I was never accepted. One of the young men in the school who had been her friend took me aside, and he said, um, the next audition was coming up. He said, don't, don't take that audition, because you just will never get in the Ballet Russe. They can't take you in that company, because they travel. I was extremely disappointed, because I realized this thing has come up now. I'm really hitting the truth. And I said to myself, well, you certainly aren't going to get anywhere if you sit down and feel sorry about, about the situation or feel sorry if you You have to keep going. So I got put my toe shoes and my little press, my little alley skirt, and went off to the audition anyway. Sergey Denham, the director, he stood up with his, he said, how would you like to become a member of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo? And it was the third year that I actually got the waltz in Les Sylphides. I think I went two years with no incident in traveling at all. The South was getting uptight. You know, in 54, they desegregated the schools. Well, the reaction to all that was growing and coming to a crisis head. Mm -hmm. 
Then I ended up in Montgomery, Alabama one time. And I mean, I was going to dance, and the bus comes into the town, and there are all these sheets and hoods all over the street. And in Montgomery, Alabama, was in the midst of a Ku Klux Klan convention, and the Valley Roos bus comes in. So we get to the hotel. I just went into the dining room, and when I went in the room, I saw all these people, little families and children, and the people being so attentive to their little children and hugging them and seeing the food was right. And I thought, oh, is this just like a holiday? These, isn't this nice? And I pulled out the chair to sit down at the table, and on the empty chair next to me was all the hoods and gowns. So it was this, these were all clan people in the dining room. And I thought, oh my goodness, all these lovely little children. I thought, I felt so sad that, you know, just to realize that all that love they're giving them, but they're spreading the hatred to them, you know? Now, somebody came to me and said, Raven, don't go to the theater, go back up in the room and shut the door and lock it and stay in there. Don't open the door for anybody. So I went back upstairs and the company went and had the performance. And that night, as the dust came in, I was, uh, there was a window out that looked out kind of like a little ravine and I saw, first and last and only time in my life, I saw the, them burning the cross. They decided I should go back to New York because they didn't know what was going to happen. Here I had been in the Ballet Russe all these years, cultivating the classical meme and having solos and and suddenly someone came to me and said, you've gone as far as you can in the company. And uh, after all, they said, we can't have a black white swan. She said, why don't you get out and get a little group together and do African dance? Well, <laughs> that's what you don't tell people who've striven just to do what they do if they want to be a classical dancer, and you spend so much time and effort because the whole thing was prove it. You, these people can't dance classical dance. I was just so tired, I could feel it. I just felt exhausted physically and emotionally. So I said, I just have to stop for a while. I graduated from UArts in 2012 with a degree in dance education with a major in ballet. And I went to so many auditions, I couldn't even tell you. At one, and they're all so expensive. I had to call family members a couple of times to ask if, they, if I could have some money to go to auditions. My young arts number is 08002569 slash 101. The title of my piece is Dream. The training is very expensive. Um, my parents sacrificed a lot to keep me in dance. I'm so grateful that my parents were able to do that, but everybody's parents aren't able to afford that. Didn't get anything, so I had to go back home. I had like a regular person's job. I was a waitress, you know, to even out and pay for, help pay for the, the student loans. I kind of lost focus when I went home this past year, and I was getting out of shape. I knew after that experience in high school that color was going to be an issue. I didn't want anything else to be an issue, so I stopped eating red meat because I didn't want weight to be an issue. 
I didn't want them to be like, well, not only are you black, but you're big too, so. <laughs> Well, I'm at Joffrey Summer Intensive in New York right now, being a chaperone in the dorms. So one of the perks is being able to take classes when we're available. And you just see everyone else get a job, and you're like, why not me? I've also heard it's the politics. Sometimes it's not the director that makes the decision, it's the board. And the board is always full of people who have only seen ballet in one specific color, so they're not ready. There's a visual element to ballet that makes people stop and makes people think, well, I don't know if it'll look like ballet if it doesn't look like 12 identical swans with exactly the same bodies and the same skin tone and the same hair tone standing in exactly the same position. are doing things the same way they've been done for hundred, hundreds of years. And I think the classic works need to be performed in that, that same way, with that same honor to the tradition. And actually, the identicalness of ballet is not that you literally look the same, but that you embody the same intention, the same spirit, the same idea, the same movement. You can only you can only do so much before you're just like, whatever, I guess I'll go back to school or do something else, because I don't want to do modern. I've had teachers in the past like, well, have you ever thought about going to Alvin Ailey? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Love Alvin Ailey, respect them, seen plenty of their works, but I don't want to be a modern dancer. And I felt like they suggested that company just because they were a black company. Pretty sure if I wanted to do modern, there would have been some place somewhere that I would have ended up. I refuse to be pushed over there. I would rather stop dancing than be forced to do modern. I would rather put on point shoes than be barefoot. When, when Dance Theatre of Harlem disbanded, all those wonderful dancers couldn't find work because they still weren't hiring black ballet dancers. When um, the company went on hiatus in 2004, I actually did auditions for other companies, and there were a lot of companies who I felt, you know, wanted to hire me, but I had to start all the way from the beginning again. And I just didn't really want to do that because I had been working so hard and I felt like I was at a level where I shouldn't have to like start over as an apprentice or in the second company. I see those gorgeous young women from, from Dance Theater Harlem. They could meld right into that corps de ballet because they already have Balanchine ballets under their belt. They have been doing all of those ballets. I mean, they have all the aesthetics except color. And then they were hiring, if they hired anybody black, a woman, they had to be so fair. And then you have people at auditions telling you you're not good enough, you don't have the right body type. By then, you're saying those things to yourself sometimes. We're still living with Balanchine's idea, a very small head, uh, a, a, a small trunk, and really long legs, and looking like um, a straw. They say ballerinas don't have large busts. They don't have 
large glutes. You, they don't have large legs, you know. There's so many things that you're not supposed to have, quote unquote, when you're a ballet dancer. But you know, when you look at that generation of dancers that, that really inspired people, who really made people love this art form, they were short, they had flat feet, but they had to do a certain kind of work to make this happen. That work is where the art is. I rested for a while and then I started auditioning. I went to ballet theater and auditioned. I spoke to with Mr. Balanchine. And I went to the Metropolitan Opera and auditioned. I know I was tired and disappointed, especially that I couldn't get something else. Women singularly have this problem more than African-American male classical dancers. If you look at all the ballet companies across the country, when they have one, it's usually a male. You know, the exotic-looking, special male. There's something about the woman that is, makes more difficulties for them, and I wonder if it's the sense of the classism being within the female dancer. The sense of the transcendence of gravity, and the spirit of woman, your Giselle, your sylph, everything, the white thing. And they just feel that that's contrary to what an African-American who would represent something more vitally part of the realities of life and, you know, the, the earth, the mother earth kind of thing. A dancer who was a part of the National Ballet of Holland, he was one of the top dancers. He was an African-American dancer who we never saw. His name was Sylvester Campbell. He called me and he said, uh, I, I would like to dance with you. Why don't you come to Holland? And I was on my way to Holland um, in the end of August and joined the National Ballet of Holland and had a wonderful experience and I had nice roles in these ballets. But I decided I loved America too, so I thought, well, maybe I'll go back and see. But you, you want the best of both, you know, that's human nature. And I just, something deeply in me is American, and I missed a lot of the way, even though we're like, plates and earthquakes rubbing up against each other. There's a certain sense of the energy. It's very sad that you have to leave your home. I just never got another job in the United States as a dancer. You can look at case-by-case case, um, uh, examples of African-American dancers that have made it and have succeeded. How did they find that training at a young age? They aren't all from New York. They're not all, you know, they're not all just going into the School of American Ballet or another wonderful school in New York. So they, you know, they obviously sought it out or had good training early on in their lives available to them. I keep coming back to exposure as being just so critical. When you are a young dancer, you do look to things that inspire you, and the very fact of someone going before who's accomplished, I think it should be said and talked about that there was, back in 1955, an African-American woman who had been a ballerina Now, she is someone I loved. Because I remember seeing her dance, and I remember being so impressed with how she came out on stage. That's regality of 
how she stood on stage. She could jump, she had control, she had strength. She was absolutely lovely, and I missed her so much when she left. Now, why, why isn't a dancer like that your first soloist? Oh, my God. And she's gorgeous. She was a dancer that I think, I feel, understood style and artistry. She truly worked on these things as an artist. She had these long legs. She had the arms, and she brought the arms up, and she just slid that foot in second, that beautiful arch, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I almost fainted. I said, this is someone, and this is the thing. Then you're so scared they're not going to be able to make it, and you see that talent there. It's Laurie Anderson. See, now these people, I didn't know them personally, but she was the top of the Houston Ballet. She did, she became one of their ballerinas. We were discussing us, uh, Debbie Austin. And somebody said, well, she got discouraged about, and I said, why did she get discouraged? Why did any of them get discouraged of their talented? And then I thought to myself, yeah, I got discouraged and I left. You know, you forget. I mean, Misty, everyone is crazy about Misty Copeland. And here she is now finally doing these great ballerina roles, you know? And you have to have the roles in order to grow artistically. Going all the way down, Grand Plié, two, three, four, coming up two, three, open to the second on four. Same thing, second, fourth, fifth position. Imagine that it's... People. Alvin Ailey had invited me to run his scholarship program. So I knew I had that job. I purely loved every day that I spent in the classes. Three and four. Here we have fondue. And stretch. I came by and visited Joan's school, and we had a little chat. And um, she hired me to uh, teach her advanced kids. That was 38 years. A go. Put them together. There you go. Two and then three and then four punches five. Okay, so I want to do that lofty position. Here we go. One. Well, you know, I started my dance school in 1960 because I thought, well, maybe I could give someone else the opportunity I didn't get. I started bringing in modern dance teachers so that the kids would not only just know ballet, but they would know all dance, because I knew that they had to be able to do it all. It was like a sculpture to him, so we have to be really clear that the shape is clear. Joan Myers Brown understands the importance, especially having a predominantly African-American company, that we are looked at with a different kind of microscope. She wants people to see in her company that we can do it, and do it well. Rosita, you want to play directly center, exactly. Dolores Brown's role is, is just that of the continuum of Miss Brown, to make sure that we are the best artists we can be. You can't walk in her class uh, unpulled together without your shoes, without proper, you know, your toe shoes uh, sewn correctly. It just is because she knows that people are looking at that and they will size you up by that. 
And when you leave her class, you end up being educated in the essence of what ballet represents. I'm very torn with my advice to anybody of color who wants to be in the ballet. We are way behind in just our whole attitude about ballet and people of color. We are in the dark ages. I still can't fathom why the major companies are having that as a problem. So I don't go to New York City Ballet anymore, and I don't go to American Ballet Theater anymore. The last time I went to New York City Ballet, I went because I wanted to see Dancers at a Gathering, which is one of my favorite Jerome Robbins ballets. And I said, this, was, this is my last performance that I'm witnessing this. When I saw Dance Theater do Serenade, I couldn't, I couldn't applaud at the end right away because it was so breathtakingly beautiful. Now, why could those girls not then join the Corps de Ballet of New York City Ballet? Don't you think for a minute that if there were people of color in numbers, not tokens, in numbers, on that stage, that there wouldn't be bottoms in those seats. Let's be vulgar, let's think dollars and cents. You have an untapped audience. When we went to go see ABT perform Swan Lake, there were a lot more um, people of different backgrounds there, and I think that's the count to Missy Copeland and what she's brought to ABT. Open the door, they'll walk right in. Beautifully walk in. And it'll be rich, and it'll look like America. And I don't, I don't want to see any more tokens. I want to see numbers now. And I hope somebody listens to me at some point. I doubt it, but I hope they do. I am a flight attendant. I am flying the friendly skies. I was dancing with a small dance company, but that's not where I wanted to be. And I just feel like every time I was trying to like make some moves, I was getting no. And I was just like, if I have to go back to do this small company and then work as a waitress all day and all night, it's not gonna work out. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't last. And then a friend uh, suggested flight attendant and I was sitting there waitressing and you know, dancing and I was like, all right, well, we'll see what happens. I think I'm still making the choice, because every now and then I struggle with the thought of going back into dance. I think it came to the point where I was just mad and like, I was like, oh, I don't want to be here anymore. I just want to move on, like I wanted something else. I don't want to hate dance. It's a very, very competitive field, uh, especially for women. Uh, there's just no two ways about that. Many young girls study ballet, and there just aren't that many jobs in this country. is an exclusive art form. You know, nine-tenths of the people in a classroom are not gonna be 
regardless, there's a, there's a classroom of white dancers. Nine tenths of them are not going to be dancers. You know, you've got to look right, you've got to feel right, you've got to have the ability to count and stand in line, or, and you've got to have something to express. I mean, there's a lot of requirements there. Sometimes you're just not what they're looking for. So then every company before I went to the audition, I would look and see how many African-American women they had already hired. And if they already had one, I already knew I wasn't getting it. Even the, um, the people who are doing the auditions, I feel like they look at you a little harder. You just got to, you got to blow them out the water. I don't know if I would call it regret, but I do have some, some sadness for not dancing anymore. Um, I can't, sometimes I try to ask myself, did I try really, really hard or did I just give up? And I still can't honestly answer that question to myself because I don't know. I mean, I went to auditions and I tried and I made all these sacrifices in different ways to try to be a, a dancer, but either it just didn't work or either I just wasn't trying hard enough. And I, I don't know. I don't know which one it was. So. When um, the school opened back up, the ensemble came back and Mr. Mitchell actually called and asked me to come back. Dance Theatre of Harlem started off with two ideas, to transform lives through art for young people in Harlem and to give dancers of color a place to mature and grow into artists, to have a career as ballet dancers where nobody said they could have one before. So in doing those two things, Nancy Hong actually did a third because it, it enabled people to look at this art form of ballet in a different way, to show ballet didn't have a color. People want ballet to reflect the past, but I think that ballet really has to reflect the present and project the future. And that's what Nancy of Harlem has been able to do. It's so important for people to realize what are you looking for when you go to see ballet? Well, people go for different reasons. Some people do go for the, the reassurance of a world that hasn't changed. Some people go because they're ready for their minds to be open and to see another kind of beauty. This is not just about ballet. Our society today is just moving at a very, very slow pace when it comes to diversity. You know, it can't just be Dance Theater of Harlem that accepts dancers of color. It has to grow to other companies. I'm like, no! <laughs> Especially in areas like this, kids don't really get to see um, ballet that much. Unless their parents are into it, then it's like, right. they don't even know it exists sometimes. Yeah.
You know, we're in America, and I think it's very important that we represent the diversity of uh, American people. Unfortunately, we audition between 300 and 500 dancers, let's say. And out of that, maybe there's five, maximum 10 African-American. Uh, also, uh, for Hispanic, there's also more, you know, but maybe 20, 30 maximum. So that's, that's the way it is. So it, it's, uh, we cannot just complain about it. <laughs> you just have to, to be proactive, you know, and say, is that important to me or it's not? Uh, some dancers just don't come to audition because they don't feel comfortable in the ballet company. Maybe they have that preconceived idea that they're not going to be accepted. There have been, I guess, barriers maybe in my own mind, uh, thinking that I can't do something because of the color of my skin or because I don't feel like I look like the next, you know, girl um, next to me. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Like, I'm never gonna be able to be a soloist or a principal. Like, what am I thinking, you know? It, it can really consume your mind and... I think it's up to us to also, for them to believe that it's going to be the right company, that they were going to be really welcome. Don't take just one African-American dancer, male or female, and then you have done diversity work that you wanted to do. It's more, let's go to discover them. Recently, I talked to Virginia Johnson, and she's the director of Dance Theatre of Harlem. Because I trust Virginia so, so, so much, and I know what she's, the great job she's doing and she's going to do, that it would be a, a good idea to make a commitment with, uh, with her company to say that every year for the next th three years, I will guarantee her that I will take two dancers from her school, and that those two dancers will come to be members of the second company. Our second company travels and to go to the school, and that's how these young dancers are inspired, because they see uh, most of the time dancers who are just like them, you know. And uh, we need some heroes. Do you have any family members that do ballet? I'm the youngest out of three sisters, so my two older sisters, they have some background. Um, is dancing with, like, each other, is it, isn't it kind of like a team? I guess if you're dancing in a group, you all want to be together, mm -hmm. and you all want to have the same line and everything, so you have to work together and mm -hmm. just um, not just think about yourself. Yes. How many hours a day do you practice dancing? It's 9.30 to 6, kind of, that kind of next question. Don't be shy, we'll answer. Yeah. Um, at what age did you get your point shoes? The point shoes. Oh, I got my point shoes at 11. I think I was 10 or 10, 11. Yeah. Your feet are not used to it, so of course it's going to hurt your first couple of times. But it, it gets easier. The gift isn't only given to white dancers. The gift is given to others, but they have to have the opportunity. What does Balanchine say, that the ballerina should be the color of a peeled apple? But also we know that if the apple stays peeled too long, it turns brown. So, uh, you know, you got to have different shades of apples. <laughs> I don't know that we, uh, I don't know the answer as to whether we actually will see an American company that reflects the diversity of this country. Um, I would like to think that we would. 
I think that we're seeing very small steps in that direction. Uh, but but you know, how quickly that happens, and I, I, just, I just don't know. We have to, to make some changes. And so if part of that evolution, there's not more diversity uh, in a dancer's population, I don't think ballet is going to be successful. That's really what I believe. I think the future of ballet is at, at stake. We are human beings. We share things. We are identical in so many ways. The expression, the desire to be excellent, to, to inspire, doesn't belong to one group of people or another group of people. The ability to be the shining example, the example of beauty, is not restricted to skin tone. So you can have a black ballerina. The feeling of doing ballet, I just can't explain. It carries me to another place. I purely loved every day that I spent in the ballet. I knew that if I kept dancing, I could be like the ballerina on the stage.